Okay, I think we're live. <laughs> At least I hope we're live. We'll see in a second. Uh, go ahead and mute that. Can you guys see me okay? I think you can. I can see my screen, it looks like. Let's take a look. And let's see. Uh, Ta-da! All right, there is 240 of you already. Wow, that's awesome. Um, let's see. Hey, I can see you guys. You guys can see me back. Um, so let's, let's jump into it. It's been a, a crazy week. I'm I literally was just a couple minutes late cause I was setting up stuff cause I'm still editing today. I'm trying to get some content done and, uh, it just seems like a lot more editing than normal. Um, there is a ton of announcements, a ton of things going on today and it looks like a ton of questions. So let's see what's what's going on and let's see i didn't get a chance a lot of times i get to go on a minute or two early and see what you guys are you know kind of chatting about and what's going on and see what kind of questions there might be out there but like i said i was literally uh buttoning up a video if you guys follow me on instagram i asked you guys on this week on instagram if you thought it'd be a cool video to do the ivan is az prestige versus the premium i have one of each one's like a 1200 dollars guitar one's like 2700 dollars and uh, you guys said, yeah, and I'm um, doing that and I'm using a new audio capture system that to my ear sounds a ton better, but uh, it's not definitely easier. <laughs> so it's just adding more learning curve to a video is always, always fun. Uh, how is everybody else's week? Anything good? Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I just noticed. I don't understand what Alizadar is saying. I th huh. I don't know what this means. Okay, so anyways, uh, what do we got? Any good questions? First comes from Michael, says, have you ever tried Tone Shield? I haven't. Or Mono Price, 15 watt, 112 combo? I haven't. Mono Prices I've heard of. I've never heard of Tone Shield. So, interesting. It's always, like I said, it seems like I, it's, it's crazy no matter how much guitars how many guitars pedals and amps you see you get you know kind of interact with there's just i like i said every day every day without the live show even every day through emails everything through contact just bumping into people on the streets every day i learn about a an amp a pedal or a uh, guitar that i've never even heard of which is crazy uh which is nuts uh let's see uh let's see uh katana i'm gonna say this katano K-I-T-A-N-O. Katano. Uh, hey, Phil. Some thoughts on your Parker. Just rediscovered my P44. I'm in love. I've always loved my Parker. Uh, it's Mine is a is a Mojo. So it's a it's a, uh, a USA-made one. They don't make them anymore. I had two. They were twins. I got rid of one, um, you know, because you don't need twins. <laughs> I don't need two of the same guitar. Uh, this one is a custom shop one, too, uh, so it has a different headstock. A little couple of those spec changes, but very cool guitar. I mean, it's, you know, to me, it's like one of those modern works of art kind of guitars. It just didn't catch on, and I did, definitely weren't making any money with them for a long time because they were kind of expensive, and they're definitely different. So... Uh, Peter Brown wants to know, Phil, have you tried? I, I like this. We'll kind of try this, the, the tried stuff. Peter Brown wants to know if I've tried the PRS SE Custom with ba Baked Maple Neck. Yes, I have. And uh, when I was at TGU, I got to try one when I did a video with Warren Hewitt. Um, in that video, on his channel, on Warren Hewitt's channel, it's us reviewing those guitars. Um, I liked it. I'm definitely becoming a fan of the Baked Maple Necks. But like I said, I just want to be very clear. It's mostly aesthetics. I just like the way they look. There's something about them. I think I've always liked the darker rosewood necks for the most part. I like maple just fine, but I kind of always like the rosewood necks more, uh, color fretboards. And to me, the the maple, the burnt maple necks are actually even better. They're lighter than rosewood, darker than maple. It's something different. I like the way they feel. So they're very cool. Uh, we have some super chats. I saw, hold on, let's go back. I saw Scar My Guitar did a super chat. Thank you, guys. I appreciate that. Um, we have some stuff to talk about today with them, too, but we'll hit that in a minute. William Spruce says, Phil, are all guitar refinish shops horrible, horribly and notoriously many weeks or even months late in returning projects 
Uh, any you recommend? Yes. <laughs> Not yes. The answer is they're all like that. But yes, I totally relate and understand what you're talking about. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, yes. Repair shops in general are notoriously known for taking forever. You know what I mean? Uh on only not only repairs but yeah refinish work refinish paint uh, custom builds it, it just happens the the reality is and william this is something to think about i've, I've always kind of try to always hit this message home not to excuse them but for you to understand them would help um a lot of shops here's something i want you to pay attention to it doesn't even have to be in guitar it could be just a you know any business you walk into if you walk in a business and let's say the staff of that business is two people you understand that if one person gets sick, for 50% of the staff is out sick, <laughs> right? So if you're in a report, repair shop and there's one guy working, if he's out sick, it's 100% sick in the business. And, and so you understand that that really puts a, a, a kind of a slowdown on things. Plus, in my experience, a lot of repair and, uh, and uh, uh, shops like this, refinish shops, shops that do work, they're horribly managed. I mean, and, and I mean that with uh, as much respect and kindness as I can give to a shop, uh, just because, because you can understand, a lot of them are like, hey, I know how to build and fix for guitars, so they open a business. It makes sense, right? I'm good at fixing something, therefore I should have a business fixing something. But maybe they're horrible at scheduling, horrible at <laughs> the business side of it. Uh, it's not uncommon for a lot of repair people to uh, have horrible personalities. One of the things I think that's brought success to the channel is uh, I've always had a, a more of a, a nicer disposition and being a repair guy is more of a rarity than, than anything else. I'm friends with lots of repair guys. And to be honest with you, sometimes the, the repair guys that just have that kind of bland personality, that's like the that's a that's a godsend because that's better than the grumpy ones. There's a lot of grumpy ones. So, uh, so it basically to ask to answer your question is, uh, <laughs> is uh, you're basically trying to see if that's nor is that's normal, right? Yes, it is extremely normal. They are notorious. Is it acceptable? Not really. You know, you're the customer. You shouldn't have to go through that. But yes, it's going to be more normal than not finding a good shop. That's why when uh, shops do really well. They literally have followings. And then that adds to the problem too. Um, I have on, on on my repairs, I have a front of the line charge. So I charge people if you want to be, uh, if you want it fast, you should pay for it to be fast. Um, I down Deep down, I've, I've said this before. I know we've talked about this over the podcast over the <laughs> last two years of doing these. This is 128. I've said this before, so it's going to just be said again. I sometimes don't like that I do that because a lot of times the working musicians who need the guitars really fast, uh, their guitars get pushed back because someone who has money who doesn't necessarily need their guitar will pay for me to put it in front of another guitar faster service. Um, I try just like the super chats. If you notice, I try to do a super chat because obviously you're, you're giving me patronage and I try to give you respect and, and, and help you. But I also try to help the, and be give patronage to the people who are supporting me in other ways. So I try to make it even, but it's tough in business. You got to try to find, you know, Hey, you got to pay the bills and you want to treat people fair and with respect. But to that, that, to that extreme, uh, I think a lot of businesses, uh, I think, could use a front of the line charge because I think some people just really want their stuff faster than others. Um, is there any shops I could recommend? Well, there's shops I could definitely recommend for quality, but I don't even I wouldn't uh, want to recommend any shops based on speed because um, it's in, it's unpredictable. Here's why. This is the last thing I want to kind of let you in on. Um, the first thing you have to be aware of is not it's work. Every, everything in work world, repair world is feast or famine, like a lot of businesses. So you could have 20 repairs to do and it's impossible and you're working, you know, 10 hours a day, six, seven days a week and you can't keep up. And then all of a sudden you have nothing to do. So it's feast or famine. So even if I had a shop, you know, that said, hey, go to this guy and he can refinish your guitar and he's quick, even that would be based on his current you know, workload and that I'd have to be in tune with almost daily to know. So I don't know. Um, but I always, I will tell you the one I, where I live, if you live in the Phoenix area, I like Atomic Guitar Works. I like Tim. I like Harry. I like them. Uh, you know, sometimes they're slow, but not in a negative way in the idea that they're, uh, you know, not doing their work. Just sometimes, like I said, they get behind and they get behind. Um, wow. A lot of super chats. Let's do some non super chats since the super chats are penned. Like I said, if you do a super chat, I pen it and we make sure we get to it. Um, and I think if I recall, hold on a second, I have a super chat from last week. 
Uh, is that true? Let's see. Because, I, like I said, I thought somebody said that I didn't get their Super Chat last week, and I said I would make sure to do it first thing. Hold on a second. Um, and... Hmm, I might be wrong. Sometimes the weeks blend in together. Hold on a second. You know what? I will make sure I get it handled by the, by the end of the episode. We have enough time. Uh, so anyways, let's get into, because there's so many, so many, there's already almost 600 people cl- cl- closing up. Um, uh, Jose Benito Martinez Jr. says, what do I think of Reverend Guitars? Every Reverend Guitar I picked up, I've liked. I like the, the, the Mirror Factory. That's where those guitars are made. They're made at the Mirror Factory. Um... Uh, Fret King are made in the Mirror Factory. I like those as well. Uh, Reverend Guitars is a is a cool brand. Uh, quality, cool. They're pricey now. Uh, not not. And what I mean by pricey is, I mean like like I said, they're pricey. It's a thousand dollars. So it's not something that I can necessarily pull the trigger on and buy just to review it. It's just out of that out of that range. You know what I mean? Um, even viral videos don't make enough to even cover something like that. So it's really impossible to get a hold of that. And uh, you know, I don't think they work with gear review channel so much it doesn't make sense i don't see that they're they're doing that um so it's tough to say hey send me out a guitar the because i try to review guitars in three categories i should probably let you guys know this here's how i decide how to review a guitar it's actually more thought of it than it seems um you like this reverend is definitely i would say if i was gonna say top five guitars requested you guys want me to review reverend comes up so much it's definitely in the top five five guitars if i was gonna say five brands that are asked to review probably because there's very few reviews of them and that's because they don't really do a whole lot as i see a lot of interaction with the youtube review channels um i like to review guitars that you want me to review that usually means that I don't have to worry about, um, you know, anything. You'll watch it, and if you'll watch it, maybe there's uh, some views, which gets clicks, which helps pay for the bills. Or usually, if there's views, there's also merch sales. That's a big part of it. And patrons. Sometimes the people will get inspired to to kind of support the channel through, like, the tip jar, so to speak, of a patron. Um, and that works itself out. The next reason I like to review stuff is because I want to review it. That happens a lot, too. Sometimes I just like stuff. You know what I mean? I I, uh, I bought an AZ, and that's why I asked you guys. That's why I asked the, the Instagrammers if they if followers, if they wanted me to review it, it's because no one asked me for an easy review. I just bought one and I thought maybe I should review it because I bought one. Um, and the third reason is because a company asked me to review it. And that that happens obviously somewhat often, less often than you think, but more more often than I can usually handle. Um, and, uh, and I try to also, so what I do when a company asks me if I want to review something, I try to figure out if it fits in the first two categories, something you guys will watch or something I'd like to do. So there you go. Reverend would fit <laughs> in all three of those categories, but I don't know. We'll see. We will definitely see. Um, <laughs> you guys are so funny. Uh, let's see. Peter Brown wants me to know to have a good week because he just got a new job. Congratulations, Peter. That's awesome. New job is 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 awesome. Always. Uh, huh. Uh, Alejandro Garcia says, will I ever do a full review of my carbon fiber acoustic? I did a review of that. I don't know what you mean by full review. You mean longer in time wise? Um, see to me, it's weird. Cause I don't know a lot of times when you guys ask for that stuff, uh, it's confusing, uh, to see what exactly you guys are looking for because all my videos are done the same way. Every video is the same way, whether you see how you see them is different, but how I do them is the same. All review videos are done with one shot camera that takes me anywhere between 40 minutes to an hour and a half of me filming. And then I edit it down into what you see. And some reviews are 20 minutes, some are five, some are two. And it all has to do with how, uh, if I've, you know, how well I cover all this stuff. Cause if I can cover all this stuff in five minutes, then I do it. Um, but yeah, if you want more of an in, in kind of in depth thing, maybe I can go into that. That'd be cool. Okay, uh, uh, Sweet Jay wants to know how, this is going to be a theme today, <laughs> what do I think of guitars? Sweet Jay wants to know, how do I uh, how do I like that PRS Mira behind me? Uh, is that a core? I have two PRS Miras, they're both cores, they're pretty much what I play. Uh, that's what I play if I play PRS. The PRS I play the most is my Mira, and then the John Mayer Silver Sky is definitely second. Um, and... I think I've said this before. If not, it's just, you know, you you know what? I've heard it so many times. I feel like I'm just repeating it from another channel. 
Um, I don't even necessarily want to play my John Mayer Silver Sky. I would rather play my Strat, but my John Mayer Silver Sky sounds like the Strat I want. Does that make sense? Like, it sounds... Like, I play the Silver Sky. It's not because I'm like... I, I, I mean, I like PRS. I like John Mayer, like I've said before. And I like Strats. But I don't play it because I like John Mayer PRS. I play it because I like Strats, and it really sounds like a Strat. It's This it's really sounds good. Um uh let's see what else okay we got some super chats let me hop over to the super chat ones if i can hop to the right screen let's see and and then i have an we'll do a couple super chats and an announcement wow you guys are like filled up fast okay uh it says uh walt hudson says phil i am a tenor guitar player and i've been stoked for a fender tenor telly that was at NAM. Suddenly, it has disappeared from their site. Any di any idea what's up? Um, if you saw it at NAM, keep in mind this is one of the things, uh, Walt, uh, that happens at NAM. Um, a lot of times, product is either teased at NAM. In other words, it's something that may happen in the future. Sometimes it's product early release, which means it is happening, and you've seen it before everybody else. And sometimes, in my experience, I have seen so many products at the NAM show that have never come to fruition. So many. Um, all the time. It, so it, it would not shock me if it doesn't come to fruition. Um, you could probably contact Fender and uh, see if they would let you know if it's com something coming. I would imagine, well, if you contact the Fender customer service, they would at least do the investigation to tell you that it's... Uh, that. Well, here's what I'm saying. They probably would keep it secret if it is coming, but if it's not coming, they probably let you know. Does that make sense? So at least you'd know for sure. You could probably contact them. They seem pretty forthcoming uh, on that. Um, at least somebody will try and find you the answer. But I, and to answer your question as a whole, it would not shock me if you did see it and then it never came to fruition. It happens all the time. So there you go. Because um, they're testing. They want to see what dealers and people think of product. They put it out. Sometimes they put it out just for some excitement to see if people will get excited. Like you get excited and here we are talking about it. It's a great way to get people talking about your brand. Make something. It's like, uh, you know what? I'm not into cars, but I understand the car shows do the same thing, right? You go there and there's Ford will put out this future car and they never make it, right? I see Jeep do that a lot. <laughs> I don't know much about cars, but Jeeps, I see Jeep always making up some something that never seems to come to light. Uh, Matt Wells says, hey, Phil, um, how much difference, if any, do you think covers make up the sound? Oh, do, OK, so covers for humbuckers. How much do they change it? I uh, love the sound of my friends, Duncan Pearly Gates, and I want them, uh, but I want zebra coils. I literally cannot hear the difference of the cover or not. They claim there's a difference. It's one of those things. Here's here's the reality of all this. I always think I always like to go with the idea that there is a difference. I think that's a great philosophy over time you know is there a difference between tone wood is there a difference between the tone of mahogany and ash i'm gonna set all the trolls of fire right now and say yes uh is there a difference between putting a cover on a pickup watch you guys are going to probably go crazy with the typing until they get the answer i'm gonna say yes that's an easy answer to say yes now let's say it's 0.000001 right that's what's great is so in other words does it matter i don't think it matters is it different Sure. Same, same logic, right? So yes, I think there is a subtle difference. I think if you AB them, you get the right room, the right guitar, the right time, the right temperature, your ear detects a slight difference. Can it be there? Absolutely. Is that real? I don't know if it's real. I don't worry about it. Like I don't literally worry about covers and stuff like that. Um, to me, uh, and I've used this uh, example of perfect time, uh, uh, perfect, uh, many times when it comes to uh, differences in things. Uh, tube screamers. When people AB tube screamers, sometimes they chuckle because to me, ABing them, you'll hear the difference. But if you step on a tube screamer or a clone of a tube screamer, if it sounds like a tube screamer, it's a tube screamer. So, so in that case, like I said, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overanalyze that. That's just um, one of the things that I do when I make videos about that stuff, like the 18 foot cables, or I did, uh, what else did I do? I did some weird ones. Oh, the batteries. Remember I did the batteries? I love it when the trolls <laughs> the tro I like feeding the trolls. Somebody's got to feed them. They got to otherwise, you know, whatever. They, uh, <laughs> the the batteries. Uh, can you hear a difference between, you know, the two different kinds of a 9-volt battery? Sure. But when I mean can you, I mean, yes, if you isolate it, if you sit there, if you focus on it, and you know it's coming, and you do all those things. But could you tell on a stage or in a practical application? No. But still, I don't think it, I think it's a, just an easier attitude to say, yeah, there's probably difference. Because that way you don't have to fight anyone. You know what I mean? Now you're just arguing how much of a difference. 
What an easier argument. Does tone wood exist? Yes. Is it noticeable to the average person? Probably not. Is it noticeable to the semi-pro guy? Probably not. You know what I mean? Um, at some point, it's just too small of a number. Um, Alice Dar McLeod said, video is titled Mark Agnesi Strikes Back Calls Guitar Justin Bill Mike Knight. Uh, all I need to watch uh, looks like Piss of War replay of last two weeks' topics. I have no idea what that is. Is that is your uh, is that Mark did that? I have no idea. It, maybe he's mad at us. <laughs> So, uh, who knows, man? Uh, or maybe somebody else did it. I can tell you this. Last week, uh, if you guys saw, we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, last week, uh, what happened that was interesting was somebody had mentioned, uh, I forget who, but it doesn't matter, one of, you, one of you guys when we were talking, that uh, Gibson took off the videos offline. We verified that they did. Somebody mentioned that uh, Mark had been let go. I got three emails all confirming that was happening. Uh, but uh, if you watch that video, within about about 60 seconds to a minute and a half, we determined that it wasn't wasn't didn't seem to be accurate and we moved on. What happened was uh, I, I think Mark clipped a piece of that, but he, he clipped it um, before the part where somebody was telling me and right, at, right, what well, was right, yeah. So in other words, it was me saying it, but it was without the the concept of it's that we're interacting. It's more, it looked like more of, I was making a video about that. And then it stopped right when I said, Oh, it looks like it was a rumor. Um, and then what happened was guitologists who are not guitologists, uh, 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 Trogly, uh, which is a great channel who I love, and I'll, I uh, and when I index this, you should check out, check out his channel, especially if you like Gibson's. Trogly, he uh, when he put he did a video to kind of clean up the mess to say here's here's what we know so far. He used the clip from Mark's video of me, which was missing that information, and he fixed that. And then I guess the gear page or gear website did the same thing. They quoted me, but they also fixed it. So right now it's all fixed. Um, it basically is all accurate, which is last week we talked about it for a minute didn't seem to be accurate. We mentioned the Gibson stuff online uh, and it looks like it upset Mark Agnesi. It pres presumably, again, who knows, maybe this all get chopped up again too. Um, the reality is simple. I I really don't want to talk about Gibson anymore unless they want to talk, unless there's to talk about guitars. Somebody pointed something out, which I thought was really interesting, which is they, they tend to make the rounds on these gear channels, but not for the gear. <laughs> Does it make sense? Like so far, think about this. So far, what we talked about today has been all guitar stuff. And then we get to that and it's never guitar stuff. It's this other stuff. And uh, I don't know, it sucks. <laughs> it's just not fun to talk about. It's not what I'm interested in. I hope it's not what you're interested in. Um, if, uh, if Gibson wants us to talk about them as a gear community, because we're just a bunch of gear people, right? We're all uh, guys and gals who love guitars and music and talking gear. And this is rather talk this than the other stuff going on. Uh, you know, when they make some cool stuff, we'll talk about it. They obviously make good stuff. So there you go. Um, what else? There is... Keen10C says, when a company like PRS does a limited edition guitar like Special Semi Hollow that came out last year, how limited are they? And really, good question, uh, especially with PRS, because PRS sometimes will do things slightly differently than other companies. Uh, and I can't say this for sure with every limited run, but I can tell you that PRS has done this particular thing, which is, I think, the right way to do it. A lot of companies will do a limited run like 500 pieces, and then basically they will make 500 pieces and that's the end of it. However, you understand this is really confusing because a lot of companies, they're speculating how many that the end user will want. Will they want 500? Will they want 400? If you make 500 and the market really wanted 2,000, you really kind of hosed yourself out of a lot of sales. If you say 500, but the market really only wants 250, now you have really what happens to a few of us, it's happened to me for sure, you buy a limited edition product that now has no resale value or no value because they made too many of them, nobody even wanted them. So PRS would do this thing that I thought was really cool where they would um, they would say, okay, from this window, we'll take orders. So like for instance, an anniversary guitar, like for let's say the 25th anniversary, they'll say from January 1st that year to December 31st that year, for that year we'll take orders. And so the limited, it wasn't a number, it wasn't set. It was just the time frame to order them was set. And so even if it took them the next two years to fill those orders, okay, I'm giving, you know, uh, that's not a true example, but they did go longer than the year. Um, 
even if it took longer than a year to make them, it didn't matter because they were just going to fill the orders that they took. So to answer your question, it is possible when somebody says limited, it's limited to the amount of orders they take and therefore it could be as many as you want. Limited usually to me when it's li limited for sure, it's when they flat out say a number. Okay. And then something fun to know about that Fender, cause everybody has a different way of doing this. Fender has a weird way of doing uh, limited editions too, by the way, which is they will release them non sequentially. So it's hard for people to figure out when the first one and the last one were done. So for instance, if the serial numbers on the first, let's say 20 guitars that are shipped, they may not be the numbers one through 10. They actually might be misaligned to stop scalping. Cause they don't want people to all of a sudden say, Oh, well the first 10 limited editions are better than the, the next 90 of this 100 run. So everybody's got a different way of doing it. That's where it gets a little confusing. Limited edition though is, is usually implies that they're only going to make so many or for a certain period of time. But until they actually state that limited edition really is more general than you think it is. Uh, if that makes any sense. So that, uh, and then also, like I said, stuff like this, I'd love to guys, you know, I know some of you guys live in, uh, work in other industries. You've learned other things about other stuff. Let me know if you've seen other things outside of our industry like that, or in this industry like that. Those are the different ways I've seen limited editions done. And I, I always think it's interesting because, um, I think sometimes limited edition gets a little carried away, <laughs> right? It gets a little, little, feels like every day is a new limited edition. Sometimes it gets a little too much, but okay, let's do a non-super chat question uh let's see uh hold on hold on okay now you guys are talking about limited edition mono uh mono uh guitars <laughs> all right you know what here's a good is a perfect Here's a perfect example. Here's a perfect time to do an announcement. So in the link down below, what you're going to find is a link to Micah's channel. If you guys know Micah, Micah is a viewer who him and his dad have done great stuff with us. You know, he does jazz hands. Um, so anyways, he's also known as the autistic artistic, or maybe it's the artistic autistic. Uh, maybe I'm getting it backwards, but either way, that's one of those ways was the right way to say it. Um, but more importantly, uh, one of us, uh, one of our viewers, did something really cool and they sent him a guitar and then he did the artwork on the guitar. It's a cool video to watch, but more importantly, him and his dad are going to auction off the guitar. They're going to sell it on eBay. There'll be a link, link down below to raise some money for charity. Um, and I put all the information. I told him I would do a shout out for you guys, for those that you guys want to help and do that. So please check that out. Um, that's a good announcement. I like to make those kind of announcements. Uh, it, not only because it's good to always help charities, but it's always nice to see a community interacting. That was something, those are the things that I, I never in a million years thought was going to happen. Just jacking my jaw on YouTube. You know what I mean? All of a sudden people would <laughs> you know I mean? connect and start interacting with each other and doing cool stuff. Um, so that was really cool. Um, I don't know. So, so if you guys are interested in, in, in doing that, plus the guitar looks cool. In fact, check this out. I'm going to just show you real quick. That's the guitar. I don't have audio. So just, just check it out for a second. So it's a Squire, but he did the custom uh, uh, painted headstock and then he did the pick guard. It's really cool. So just something to check out if you guys are interested. It's a cool guitar and uh, you can always help out. Uh, so very cool. Um, what else? So much stuff. There's over 730 you guys just, so the thing's speeding a little fast. <laughs> okay. Uh, and sometimes, like I said, talking about a community, sometimes you guys are talking back and forth on these things when I'm reading the questions. And, and uh, I actually love that, by the way. Um, so I, I think it's cool. I, like I said, the idea that a lot of you are just week, coming here weekly and hanging out, talk to each other on a Friday, I think is the, you know what, if that's all this ever ends up being is just us hanging out every Friday, I'm fine with that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Monkey Groovin says, wiring in a Les Paul kit only getting buzz out of the amp volume selector switch does nothing. Where's wiring diagram for a circuit that won't lose treble. Um, monkey grooving. Uh, there's a couple things I can do for you. Here's what I can do for you. Um, 
is uh, first I like Seymour Duncan. You can go to Seymour Duncan for uh, for wiring schematics. It's pretty easy. I mean, you can just Google schematics. So the schematic you need for the, the Les Paul, um, the question you have is not to lose treble. There's a way you can do a treble bleed on that as well. Just again, Google treble bleed circuit Les Paul. Um, try to think of it like this way. Just type what you want into Google. I know this sounds silly, but it's, it's not. You just type what you want and then the schematic. So like treble bleed, uh, Les Paul schematic and come up and then go from there. The only thing I can do you a, a favor for is a lot of people will send me pictures. If you ever send me an email to ask, know your gear at Gmail, um, a lot of times like this, when it's technical like this, and I can't see it. So, I mean, I can't, I can't react to it, but if you send me a picture, a lot of times I can look at the picture and go, that looks wrong right there. Or, Hey, there looks like there needs to be a wire there. It's easy. Sometimes I can look at that stuff and see it really fast. Um, cause you know, that stuff you wire it so many times you just get used to where everything needs to be. And you, uh, you know, everything tends to be the same kind of four or five mistakes, which is good. Um, so something like that. I hope that helps. Thomas Maynard says, what do you think about Fender's wide range humbuckers and what drive, what drive, what drive works best to give you that 80 sound? Uh, well, the, the wide range humbuckers, I, uh, I've never been into them or not into them. They've been always off my radar. You know, it's one of those things like if I pick up a guitar and it's a Fender and it has those pickups in there, I don't necessarily need to replace them, but I also don't actively look for them. So I can't say much. I don't, I don't even know anyone personally that's into them. So usually I can reference off that, you know, I have a friend or a buddy that's really into them, but not really, uh, the best drive to give the 80 sound. Oh, well that's, you know, you know, there could be a million things. I will say one of the things I'm going to say, cause I like the LPD 87. It's really good. I like that one. I like the Friedman BEOD. Um, that one's a good right now because you keep seeing it really discounted used, <laughs> right? You can pick them up for good money in the uh, $100, uh, $25 range. Um, I'm looking at my wall of pedals to think what, what I go, you know, uh, the, the, uh, JHS, um, Andy Timmons and the, uh, Charlie Brown, is that it? Brown, Charlie, whatever. That's a great eighties metal, uh, box. I'm trying to think when I play eighties metal, when I'm in that mood, what do I grab? I know I should probably, I love my, I love my 5150 MXR because of the noise gate. I really do. That's another pedal that I just really like. Um, in fact, I love it because of that noise gate. It's great. I can get a good tone out of that. Anyone else using any cool stomp boxes for 80s sounds? I mean, you know, for the 80s metal sound, I feel like those really grab it. I, ironically, what I can tell you is, um, let me go back to you, uh, your, your screen where you're at. What I can tell you, which interesting, uh, Thomas, is that it seems instinctive. Like if you said, this is what's strange. If you said to me, what's a good amp to get an 80 sound, I would actually start referring you to a bunch of amps that were from the eighties. Um, but when people talk about pedals, I don't really cite the pedals that were made during those genre, because to me, a lot of the pedals from the eighties didn't have it right yet. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you listen to it now, the newer pedals are, are really good. Also, you know what really gets a cool 80 sound? If you really want to get that really studio sound 80s get some of those 80 uh processors like the boss processor the helix uh you know any of that stuff because 80s metal is not just distortion 80s metal is definitely a lot of delay choruses you know what i mean a lot of effects added in there and uh man you really get that sound like i really like nuno bentoncourt from extreme the porno graffiti album sound and i love that sound and that sound it, for years i'd look for the distortion to get that sound because it's really thick and i just like the way his tone is and i i have the nuno in four i did the same thing i chased you know i chased that tail i i went and said i'm gonna get the guitar and then i'm gonna get the, the pedal and stuff and really what i learned for him it was about the delay his delay is where he sets the delay in his sound is how he gets that sound to sound a little thicker um and that's how i was able to achieve it jeff harbour says let's talk fuzz i just got three fuzzes the javelina i have that one i like that one ehs big muff uh pie i had the big muff pie now i have the uh this one I can get it. I can reach it. Uh, the Big Muff uh, Nano is what I like. I like it because of the size. Um, somebody said it doesn't sound as good as the full size one. Probably right. But to be honest with you, uh, I'm not devoting uh, <laughs> uh, the the giant footprint of the regular Pi Fuzz and the uh, the Kaline Puller uh, Puffer something Puffer. Oh, I'm reading it wrong. Uh, anyways, uh, I think I'm Kaline. I cannot see. I'm like wincing at the line at the screen right now. Uh, 
What order do you stack the, these? Um, stack them? I don't know. I've never stacked a bunch of fuzz, uh, fuzz pedals. I will tell you this. I run my Havelina and the Big Muff uh, uh, Nano in front of Overdrive. That's how I get the sound for that. So, But it depends on what you're trying to do, man. If you're trying to get that you know, fuzz tone, you know what I mean? The actual fuzz, fizzy, you know, like you're trying to do Weezer, you're trying to do... Uh, um, oh, why can't I? You never think of what you need when you need it. Um, who's the band that I really like that does fuzz? Oh, I give up. Anyways, if you're trying to get fuzz, I just run the fuzz pedal. If you're trying to get something else, like what I try to do, which is like Eric Johnson slash kind of tone, you run fuzz into a little bit of overdrive um, and you get that sound. Uh, and then plus anybody else that's got little, uh, oh, you know what? And we're going backwards, but that's okay. Shield 400 says Mesa, the Mesa throttle box total eighties. You know, I'm, I don't think I've ever tried the throttle box. Let's see. Chris, uh, Chris want to say Phil rocks. I make my own guitars because of this show. That's awesome. That thanks, man. That's great to hear. Um, let's see. Oh, Mark Dillon is saying the X5 Golden Brownie for 80 is designed by Thomas Blug. Uh, well, I would imagine it's good. I like everything uh, that Thomas Blug does. That guy's that guy's a genius. I got to interview him. Unfortunately, you know, the highlight, I hate to say this because, you know, it's like telling you your friend. You're like, you're my favorite of all my friends. But Thomas was like somebody I was looking forward to meeting at the uh, Gear Street 42 thing or 42 Gear Street. I was super stoked. and I And he was the very first video I did. And the audio got corrupted, so I can't I can't even release the video at all. Like you can't it can't you can't even hear anything. And um, it's, I'm just bummed <laughs> because it was a great video. But I'm gonna try and recreate what I learned from him in that video, and then make a new video with it. So let me know what you guys think. Really cool. Uh, that um. Uh. Let's see. Uh, what else? <laughs> guys, this is great. Um, what else? Wow, this is time's going by fast. Okay, um, let me get to some of these. Um, Zach A says, do you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He's got the wrong channel, man. <laughs> you, the, uh, the, uh, the, unless that's a pedal, we're probably not going to talk about it. I'm sorry, buddy. I understand. You know, I know it's like everybody's got passion. They want to put their passion out there. But this is a gear channel, so we're going to just stick it to gear. Um, uh, Catherine Faulkner, right? I'm sure I'm saying it right. Faulkner. Um, Hi, Phil. I refinished a body of a Telecaster, and I just about to put the back... Oh, put it back together. Uh, not sure if I need to solder the ground wire to the bridge like a Strat or it just has a touch the bridge. It just needs to touch the bridge. That's it. Um, just strip the wire, stick it right through. There's going to be a hole right underneath the bridge. Just make sure the, bra the braided metal part of the wire is sticking out so we can touch that. You have to grind it to the bridge, but on that, you would normally not solder it to there. And the reason is, is because when you when you screw the bridge down and compress it, there's no you want it as flat as possible, and solder is going to prevent that. You want the braided wire to flat. They're going to spin out flat like this, right? So you, it's from the pressure of the bridge. So to get it flat, you don't want to solder it. So you, you know, there's what you do. I've seen it soldered only a couple times. What when I did, um, somebody kind of like carved out some of the wood to make room for that. I don't think that's uh, necessary at all. I wouldn't do it. I didn't even want to recommend it for time saving. So no solder needed. Saxy Calzone. Look at that. Saxy Calzone. I love it. That's a great name. Uh, hey, Phil, uh, know anything about Raven West guitars? No, I know Raven Amps, which is a guitar center brand. Never heard of Raven West. But what's great about this show is whenever I do that, I'll when I index this, I'll Google it, put their website down below. What's great with you guys, I'd like to point out that a lot of times now I've had about a dozen, maybe even a, two, a dozen and a half companies email me. Um, over the last year or stuff saying that every time we do something like this, they get a bunch of spike from you guys checking out their website after I do the indexing. I want to thank you guys for doing that. Um, that doesn't really, <laughs> it's not really a benefit to the channel anyway, just kind of cool that you guys check out the stuff that we're talking about. So I'm, the reason I'm telling you that is it seems like if you're out there and you're passionate, and you want to let everybody know about something you're excited about. Whenever we talk about on this channel, it seems like it does get that information out there, which is cool. David says, David, uh, wants to know, hey, Philip, 
Great channel. Thank you, buddy. In your opinion, does carbo reinforcement in the neck really make a difference? I should we pay for it? Um, that's a great question, and it comes with a really focused answer. It is probably absolutely necessary whenever you're trying to do this crazy thin neck stuff. So, for instance, Ivan as Jackson, you know, the old BC Riches, everyone who's making these super thin necks, um, thinner necks now that we've had, you know, kind of like what we talked about last week about roasted maple not knowing for 10 or 20 years what it really is until time goes by. Here's what time taught us about the 80s necks. They twisted. Not all of them, not a lot of them, because a lot of them were cortisone. A lot of them, the, the manufacturers were, come on, let's be honest, the 80s metal guitar companies were building some great stuff for a while. But um, realistically, though, thin necks twisted. And so they twist because, again, it's a thinner piece of wood. It can absorb and, and, and expel moisture faster. There's all kinds of things in play, of course. Um, your hand sweat, you know, you name it. I'm just giving some factors. The, the important part is this. Yeah, it seems like it's a big deal. Um, does it really matter when they're doing it with guitars? Like, I've seen Fender mess with it and stuff. I have carbon fiber reinforcement in my American Deluxe Jazz Bass that, I ha that I've had since 2004. I think it's a 2004, 2003 bass is when I bought it. And... Um, you know, I, I don't think it's necessary because I haven't seen a regular jazz bass do anything, you know, twist on a normal consistency. Um, so is it in, it, does it uh, really need it? I, I can tell you this. I don't know if it really needs it, but it's a good idea, especially on those thinner necks or necks where they're doing some crazy stuff because I've seen them do some crazy stuff too as well. So it's a good idea, but I don't think it's necessary if you're going to do a, a regular traditional neck. Um, and I don't know if it's important with... Um, as maple necks as much, but it seems like a lot of the ones that have it are maple necks. Um, what I can tell you on a side note is, you know what I think is actually done just as well, like in, in, in watching it and be interacting with it and working on it as much as carbon fiber reinforcement rods on the side. And what he's talking about, so we're all clear is in the center of the neck will be the truss rod. And then each side of the neck will be two, uh, two trowels that they route out. And then they, they put in just two carbon fiber rods. And, um, sometimes they use wooden dowels and they wrap carbon fiber around them so they can flex a little bit because the rods are pretty stiff. Um, what I've noticed is multi-laminate necks uh, actually do probably just as good, if not better. So that's something you can do. So I think carbon fiber is a great way to give you the stability of a multi-laminate neck without the aesthetics of a multi-laminate neck. But I think if I was, was going to build a guitar or have somebody build me a guitar either way, and say, okay, I want to make the neck to where it's impervious to something like twisting. I think I would trust multi-laminate as much as carbon fiber. I think I would actually go with that first. So um, a lot of people complain, which again, <laughs> people complain. A lot of people complain that a lot of the necks with, multi, uh, with carbon fiber reinforcement have a different feel to them. They're stiffer. They don't react the same way. They don't vibrate the same way. So um, it's one of those things like, again, this goes back to the whole debate I had earlier. Is it, can they notice that? Sure, of course. Is it a big deal? I don't know. Um, LPC STM 69. Sure. Phil, what's the best one or two pedals or multi pedal for David Gilmore, Pink Floyd sound and sound setup. Love the channel. And yes, the shop I use for repairs has a couple grumpy gusses. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a thing, man. It's a thing. Um, and on a side note, like I said, I try to do everything with respect. Uh, one of the grumpiest guys I know is one of the best repair guys I know, but man, I gotta be in the mood to talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I've mentioned this before. One of the things that's been nice about doing repairs for as long as I have, you know, you become a resource for people, but also you have resources. I have a friend in particular, which I won't, he'll, he's watching right now. I know. And he's like, probably just looking at me like he's going to say my name anyways. And, uh, I have to be in a good mood to talk to him because you gotta be, I gotta give him energy just to get him <laughs> right like you got to start the day with a good joke and a high five or something because he's you know usually in a, a grumpy mood he's grumpy um so anyway so uh, what's the best one or two pedals or multi-pedal for david gilmore pink floyd sound and setup um love the channel yeah so that's a that's a tough one uh whenever those questions come through they're tough uh some guys uh i'm, I'm wondering if they're saying i would say to be honest with you having the helix uh the helix stomp i don't i don't think you could beat that right now in the market um i am trying so you know so you literally know that i'm literally trying in fact i'm gonna plug it so you can see it i am i just unplugged it uh i am trying this which is the uh the more 
GE200 to compare it against the Helix Stomp. And uh, so far, I like this. This is 300 bucks. I would say, I don't know why I can't get it in shot. There it is. I would say at this point, if you want a recommendation, this is what you would buy if you don't have Helix money. If you don't have the 600 bucks to go that route, I think you could buy this and be somewhat happy. Um, it's a pretty good pedal so far. I really dig it. Um, I've been really putting it through its paces. Stuff like this, man, I think you could totally get that sound. Um, you know what I mean? Get some, cause, cause that sound is definitely a, you know, you need, uh, see Matt Harrison said the Keeley dark side, that's a great pedal too. But see the problem with the Keeley dark side, by the way, it's not problem like problem with the pedal problem is you will need delay. David Gilmore's tone. It's funny. I mentioned noon earlier, David Gilmore, even more so you need delay. Uh, David Gilmore is like, when you think affects crazy people, you think David Gilmore, you think the edge from you too. You think John Mayer. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of course, but but David Gilmore, man, chorus, delays, you know what I mean? So so the, to get the, when you're talking about one or two pedals, it's definitely going to be a, a good overdrive that gives you that, that Pink Floyd tone, but then definitely echoes, delays, you know what I mean? Choruses. Uh, so that's what I'm saying. Two pedals is tough because I, I mean, it's obviously in his hands. That's where everything is. But to, to pull off the sound, you're going to want some effects. So that's why I was saying a multiprocessor might be the better way to go because then you don't have to worry about two pedals. You can actually preset those or find the presets for them. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, uh, Jason Perry says about 20 people mentioned the dark side because it's a great pedal. But like I said, it, I absolutely agree. Dark side for sure. Dark side and a delay though, because you're mentioning getting two pedals. The way the question is framed, it implies maybe you don't have pedals. What I'm telling you is, if you get the dark side, that's a great pedal. I would highly recommend that. Okay, Robert Keeley's a genius, by the way, and his pedals are amazing. So go go that way, but definitely need the delay. Um, oh, Sean Pierce Johnson saying it does have the delay. Oh, see, I don't, I didn't even know that. There you go. Oh, it's the Benson Echo Rec. I didn't know that. It's a Benson Echo stolen Echo. <laughs> so there you go. Then maybe you can get away with that. So I'd actually, I'd, I'd be curious to hear that against the Helix uh, Stomp because I love the Helix Stomp as well. Um, it's really cool. But that's cool. It had delay. I didn't know. I haven't really tried any of the, those, that pedal or a lot of the newer he Keeley pedals. There's no Keeley, de Keeley dealers by me. So... Let's see. <laughs> Sorry, you guys are now sharing. They're sharing stories about the guitar techs that were grumpy. So, nice. Maybe I should reach out to Robert Keeley and see if I can try a dark side and review it. I'm really curious now. Um, okay, next question is Amigos Play Go Playground. Amigos Playground. Is easy enough. Okay. It says, what is the purpose of binding on the body, neck, and headstock on an acoustic guitar? Does it impact the sound? Same question regarding rosette. No, it's aesthetic only, man. There's no way. There's no tone binding. Uh, now, binding around the body, binding around the rosette, that's a, uh, for aesthetics. It doesn't matter if it's electric or acoustic. Uh, technically, could you argue that it because it's plastic and it's rounder, it's smoother on the arm than maybe the two pieces of wood? Sure, there's an argument there, but I don't think that was ever it, is it part of the design aspect. I think it was literally just for aesthetic however binding on the neck is for aesthetic but it does serve an extra purpose sometimes which is when the wood shrinks um, and the frets pop out fret sprout it's a little harder for the frets to sprout out it's uh, because of the binding the binding is glued to the wood and the binding kind of holds everything together sometimes it's not as likely although it happens all the time not as likely uh, to have a guitar have the frets pop out on a good neck with binding something to think about. The other thing is the downfall though, is I've seen, cause where I live is so dry. I've seen the, the neck shrink so bad that the frets crack the binding, uh, cause it pulled in. That is not that common either, but again, something, but no, there's no real, no sound to it. No tone binding. Uh, you know, and then again, earlier I did say everything has a kind of a probably influence on that. Sure. Maybe to some degree, but I can't imagine. Uh, Let's see. Syncology says, just wanted to show some support because I really enjoy your videos. Man, thank you. I appreciate that. You guys, thank you so much. Uh, let's see. The next one, the message was deleted. Uh, it says, uh, Francisco uh, Rodriguez. So wants to says, you and Daryl Braun. I hope I say it Braun. Is it Bruin? Braun. Daryl Braun. 
Problem is that when I watch his channel, I don't think he says his name. <laughs> he says, welcome back to the channel. And then I don't think he says his name. A lot of times I'm like, am I missing it? Um, but Braun, Daryl Braun, uh, recommend fine sanding blocks to roll edges and smooth fretboards. What do you call fine? 120 grit good enough. If not, then what? I, okay, so I have heard that he did that with the sanding blocks. Um, I don't know uh, if, I, I've never really used a sanding block on the edges of a fretboard. Um, it's not something I, I normally typically would use. I understand the logic and I don't have a problem, but no, 120 would be not high enough. I don't know what he used. I would tell you what, when I'm rolling the edges of a fret, I definitely, definitely advise using a fret dress file. That's really what I really recommend. Um, the, uh, a lot of times I have mentioned, uh, you know, using the Emery board style things, right? And the reason I say that is because again, um, I don't want to rake anything across the side of the fretboard because the problem is it only will work if it's unfinished neck. If there's any finish on the neck, you're going to tear that finish off in between the sides of the fret. So you want to keep all the sanding isolated to each fret as much as possible. Anytime I've ever showed the uh, anyone where I'm sanding across the fretboard and not doing all the frets, it's because the guitar is inexpensive and you don't care about it and you're just trying to get it smooth without paying a technician anything. Uh, on that note, if you're going to use the uh, sanding block, uh, I would go as high as grit, a uh, higher grit. Uh, 120 is too rough by far. Um, I'd say 400 you know what I mean? Think of it like you don't want to take material away. So 400 is where I would probably say 350 would actually be too much or too low. I think 400. I like 400. Start there. Um, let's see. Uh, so I hope that helps. Whiskey Lima says, how rare was the sage green metallic finish on the MIM standard strats before the launch of the player series? Uh, thanks for your advice uh, from the K uh, New Year gear, by the way. Um, wait, thanks for your advice from last KYG. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Um, let's see the metallic, the green metallic finish. I don't know. I, you know, it's, I wish I had some insight on that. I don't know exactly how much they produce of which color. What I can tell you here. So again, stuff I can't tell you cause I don't know. I can only start with what I do know in the Mexican standard series in the Mexican standard series of strats. We do know from Fender that they do sell mostly the white one, the sunburst, and then the black. Um, it's probably in that order. So, you know, if it's not just reverse the reverse, the sunburst to white. So it's sunburst white then black. Um, but that's usually the way they sell it. So, and I, what I mean by that is even Fender will tell you, uh, as a dealer, uh, that, I mean, it's by far those three and then all the colors they do. That's why when everybody goes, why don't they do this color? Why don't they do that color? It's because really, to be honest with you, and as a dealer, when I, I mean, I've sold millions of dollars of fenders. I mean, that's not an exaggeration, millions of dollars. Me personally, and I don't mean the store, just me one by one customer of customer over a period of 12 years as a fender dealer. Um, yeah, that's what I sold. <laughs> Right. Everybody would come in and go, wow, look at that new color color. And they're like, oh, it's burnt orange. And then while they, before they would ring up, they go, I think I'm going to get the black one. <laughs> and it's no different than when people buy cars. Right. You go on the lot and you're like, I'm going to get the lime green truck. And then you draw off the lot with silver, white or black. <laughs> so uh, so that's the same thing. So uh, my guess is how many they sell. I don't know. But a lot, lot less fewer models are those colors. That's why if you think about this, it's been so consistent. That's why when you look at the past, when you look at vintage guitars that's why the colored vintage vintage guitars are worth so much because they made so much fewer of them than other than the standard three core colors and those that's why those three color colors never go anywhere they're the same three core colors every year just they're not exciting you know when he wants to walk in a store full of three of the same color strats that you've seen a thousand times so uh uh, guitar hack. Hey, guitar hack. What's up? Says, Hey, Phil, where do you think a compressor should go in the pedal chain? Um, a lot of people like it. Uh, I like it first, so I'll put it first, except for, I always put it right after my wall. Some people will put it before a wall. Some people want everything to be, they, they want the, the guitar to hit the compressor, compress, and then see other effects. I like it to be the first thing that I see as well too in my chain, but I will always put it after the wall. The, the, that being said, <laughs> it really, really messes with your wah. It cuts out your highs and lows and it does a lot of stuff to your wah that a lot of people would not enjoy. I actually want my wah to be a little anonymous. Does that make sense? Like I'm not trying to stick out. Um, and the, the, uh, the, if anything there's, you know, everybody's like, I've mastered the technique of, I have mastered the technique of sounding when I'm jamming with people and playing, sounding 10% better than I am. 
Um, I really feel that way. I, <laughs> I, I don't mean to have an ego about this. <laughs> <laughs> just laughing uh, that I think I can make myself sound better than I am. But I, I do. I think I make it, I've learned to just kind of figure out how to give everybody a taste of something so that uh, my shortcomings don't pop out as much. So that's one of the things I do, too. I compress the wah sound. So, again, everything just kind of smushes in and it sounds a little, you know, kind of less pops out as much. Um, but uh, but that's where I would put it. I always put it first. The it adds more noise, too, but I like it. Uh, let's see. Uh, Andrew Carn says, Phil, are there tricks for fret leveling a compound ra radius neck? This is a question I, I actually got to talk to um, two people who manufacture and do compound radius necks. And this was a real, and actually, so you know, Ron Thorne, when I did that Ron Thorne builder, master builder interview, that's something me and him talked about. Um, and it's because a lot of a lot of techs over the last, because here's the thing, a lot of techs in the last 10 years, I'm trying to think back, is that 2009? Yeah, 2009, we'll say 2007-ish. Until 2000, the early 2000s, you didn't see tons of compound radius necks, all right? Think about compound radius, it was mostly on Jackson guitars. That's mostly where you saw it. And you didn't see it on the inexpensive Jacksons. You mostly saw it on the expensive Jacksons. Um, and then it just found its way into everything, right? I mean, it got on Defenders and, and all this stuff. So, I mean, mostly Ibanez's were 16-inch radius. You know, uh, Gibson's were 12. You know, Fender's were 9.5. And, and that was pretty standard for a long time. So when you started getting compound radius necks, you started working on them the way almost like you would work on anything. You're just trying to get all the frets level. Um, I have done nothing different when I, when I rate, when I radius or not when I radius, when I level a fretboard, I've noticed that, um, I've heard a couple theories, so I'm just going to tell you the way I do it. And, and somebody's going to say it's wrong. And some people are going to say it, that's the way they do it. What I've learned with working with is, uh, dozens of luthiers now, just in the last year in their shops, I've learned that no two luthiers seems to be doing anything the same way. So I'm really changing the way I think about stuff now, because in this last year, as you guys know, I've been traveling, I've been to so many really amazing luthiers like, like i said ron thorne to you know uh the guys at framus to all these small you know custom hand builder guys and when you go in there and you watch them work and you talk to them and hang out with them and trade secrets what i'm learning is all of them have different secrets and all of them are doing different it's weird um so back to what i'm saying i radius a, a compound radius or i'm sorry i level a, a frets on a compound radius the same way i would do any fretboard. I'm just trying to get all the frets level. I don't literally take a sanding block and change them as I go up and down the fretboard. Um, it's because unless the fretboard's dramatic, the only ones which I haven't had to deal with uh, that much that are really dramatic is some of the fender ones, which are like nine and a half to 16. That's pretty extreme. But for the most part, a lot of the compound radius out there are 12 to 16. They stay pretty normalized. So it's not that big of a deal is what I'm trying to say. Um, let's see. Uh, Ross Holmes said, just joined. Hello. See, that gives me a second to, to, to breathe and maybe drink a water. We're in the bonus round now, guys. It's been one hour, but we had super chats that push in, is into, uh, extra innings, so to speak. And, uh, so let me hit these really, really let's go. Uh, let's see. Um, we have Doug Bishop says, have you tried metal welding torch tips for nut files? Um, I ordered a set and we'll try it next week. No, I have not tried metal welding torch tips uh, for nut files. I haven't. Um, I never even, no, I didn't even know you could do that. That's really cool. <laughs> Doug, I would love it if you would uh, share with me at gear at gmail how well it goes and i will order a set and give it a try and maybe it's something that we can share i'm assuming you're doing it because it's a lot less expensive than fret files fret files are pretty expensive so um but i'm curious I, i'm really cool huh interesting uh nathan boone says hey phil why do people hate pcb wiring and guitars uh you know why because it's it's harder to work on <laughs> Um, what I mean by that is it's, it's more fine. Working on a PC board is different than working on big, hunky, you know, components, right? It's a lot easier to get your soldering iron and get in there and work on a, you know, uh, an output jack to a potentiometer to a big, you know, hunking, uh, uh, a resistor, you know what I mean? Uh, so on a PC board, it gets a little finite, the Epiphone ones, and really also keep in mind, 
a lot of the other than the Gibson ones, you know what I mean, which are really trying to do something different. A lot of the companies that were using the PC board stuff and the guitars are using cheap stuff. You know what I mean? Because it's lower price for guitars. So that's why they hate it. Um, what, what I think is, I think somebody said this. I actually, I know somebody said this. Somebody said this on my live show uh, probably within the last year that the airplane model industry, the flying, you know, airplanes and stuff and all that stuff, they are using all clip-on componentry and we're probably going to, we need to go to more to that. And you're seeing more of that stuff. Mad Hatter, Mojo Tone, lots of companies doing this clip-on technology. Um, you know, EMG does it. Seymour Duncan's got some, you know, right? Easy clip, easy stuff. No soldering. I think, um, I think it's a good idea. What I've said before in the past, I'll stick with that because sometimes, you know, as you learn, you change or as, you know, things happen, you change, adjust. But this is something I haven't changed yet. I think for the average person out there doing work on their guitars, the clip systems are the greatest thing ever. As someone who's been working on guitars for the, as long as I have with a soldering iron, I would rather solder. That's what it is. You know what I mean? I because I'm familiar and I'm faster at it. Learning the clipping system, I have to look at you know I have to look at a schematic. So when somebody brings me a kit that's supposed to be easier, it actually takes me longer because I have to reference back to the instructions. Like okay, what is this clip into, and what is this and this what prong did this thing go to? See what I'm saying? We're we're soldering. I just know this wire goes to the center lug. This wire goes to the outer lug. You know, ground this lug. Do this. It makes sense. But um, but I don't know. I don't know why people. I don't think people hate PC board wiring and guitars. I think. Repair guys hate it, <laughs> and then we tend, we tend to be vo voice our opinions. But I'm curious to see what you guys think. I don't know if you guys would hate that or not. Um, I know we'd hate it a lot less if there was more drop-in ready stuff, so you could just pull stuff and drop in stuff. I find out, uh, you know, when you have a PC board and a guitar and you don't like a pickup, that's what sucks because a lot of times, you know, you can unplug the clip from the pickup, but the pickup you're going to buy doesn't have the clip in most cases. Please, somebody's going to put in the comments that they make pickups with clips. I know they do, but we're talking about... You know, it would be nice if the in industry was standardized, that DiMaggio and Bare Knuckle and Seymour Duncan all had the same clips and everybody was using the same system. It would be a lot easier. Uh, Fender Rick 55 says, hey, Phil, how different would your gear recommend recommendations be <laughs> if uh, uh, before the new 20-year-old player versus 40-year-old? Uh, huh, I don't understand the question. Let me get back to it. It says, how different would my gear recommendations be for a 20-year-old player versus a 40-year-old player who has not played in 20 years. Um, not much different. You know what I mean? Because I don't look at 40 as as like, okay, you got to deal with, you know. I, I have a lot of friends that are 50. <laughs> and it seems like 50 is where I've been told, you know, hand, you know, your hands are going to get stiffer. A lot of stuff happens to you. So I don't really look at 40 as the, okay, you got to start adjusting, you know, for age, so to speak. Um, the part that you mentioned is that, you know, is that a 40 year old player who has not played for 20 years. Um, what I would recommend different to a 40 year old player who hasn't played for 20 years, try to educate yourself before, before you decide to go back. The craziest thing I see with guys and gals who get into this after being out of it for 20 years is the first thing they do is they try to go and get the thing they had 20 years ago. And that stuff is so outdated, right? I mean, obviously, like an old Fender amp and a Marshall amp are still in, you know, they're still Vogue. They're still cool. Uh, Gibson, Les Paul, uh, Fender Strat. What I'm talking about is like, they're like, hey, I want to get a processor. So I need a Digitech RP1. <laughs> You're like, no, no, no. Everything's way better than that now. Don't get that. <laughs> you know what I mean? You can, you can find other stuff. The only thing that's cool, though, is if you do want to get that stuff, that stuff is cheap you know what i mean you can get uh, great digitech and old stuff art stuff uh dirt cheap but recommendation wise i would just say uh nothing really different you don't really need anything different so yeah everybody plays the same i think i don't think that works that way um uh for the most part and then let me get back to the community hang uh let's see hold on a second Ah, uh, where are we at? Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You guys are jumping around. I'm trying to do a non-super chat. This is going to be a long episode, I can tell, because there's so many questions backed up. Uh, Erie, Erie R says he's an old school solder guy as well. Yeah, I mean, you know. Okay. Okay, so let's go to, hold on a second. 
By the way, big shout out to Sean Pierce Johnson. He's hanging out. And he, if you don't check out his channel, check out his channel. I'll put a link down below. Um, he's a great channel, especially for a lot of stuff like pedals too, resource pedals. I watched a bunch of his videos this week even. I had him playing in the background when I was doing stuff or doing some repairs and I enjoyed him um, as always. Uh, Craig says, thoughts on using the Rumble 40 with a baritone a axe. Okay. Uh, good alone or with an HRDX would benefit more with a rumble with compression horn. Um, in other words, he's asking, hey, should he run his baritone guitar through the rumble, which is the uh, Fender bass amp, or should he go with the uh, guitar amp? What's great is you can do either one. It depends what you're going for. I personally look at a baritone as a low-tuned guitar and not a bass guitar, so I wouldn't run it through a bass amp. It will make it sound more like a bass. If you're trying to make your baritone guitar sound like a bass, the bass amp will finish the task. But if you want your baritone to just be the low-tuned guitar it is, I would stick it through a guitar amp and not worry about it because that's where you're going to get that guitar tone is from those guitar speaker and the guitar amp um so that's the way i look at that you just pick one of those lanes depending on what you do but my baritone guitar i run through a guitar amp uh josh uh wozniak says is sterling music man silhouette better than a squire to improve and modify um yeah you're not saying what squire so i'm going to assume that you're talking about the middle of the line squire not maybe the high end squire it, in my experience touching guitars the sterling music man stuff is slightly above in quality than what squire puts out on average again some of the squire classic vibes and the squires now touch 500 bucks and they're pretty impressive but uh here's what i would say sterling music man this is a great way to put it sterling music man is to squire what i feel music man is to fender a slightly higher end quality version, but not necessarily what everybody wants. Some people just want Fender and doesn't care about Music Man. But Music Man is a, I look at Music Man as a slightly premium of Fender. I look at Silhouette uh, Sterling by Music Man as slightly premium to Squire. So I would say that's a, a fine way of looking at that. I don't think a lot of people would have a, a, a complaint with that statement. Some people will probably like their Squire still as more, but doesn't. I don't think that would uh, make the statement not accurate. Mad Tone, Mad Tone, Mad, Mad Town, Brian. I installed a tusk nut on a new Made in Mexico player strat and cut slots fairly low. Now open G string resonates more than I like unplugged. Had someone cut it back the slot uh, to taper more. Other suggestions? Sure. Um, the trick is you're saying the G string resonates more. In other words, it's louder than the other strings. That's what I would get from that. Uh, you know, you could mean sustains longer, but I think you mean louder, resonates, it's louder. Um, the, so the, the fix that you guys implemented was you had somebody cut back of the slot to taper more. In other words, you, yeah, the, 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 the base side of the, of the, uh, the nut, you cut the angle down, create, which should create more down pressure. Um, hmm. You know, here's, here's, I can tell you, I don't know what to suggest to you. I can only tell you what I do. Whenever I cut a nut, I'm always aware of the fact, and it only happens one out of 10 times, maybe one out of 20. I'm always ready to do another one. <laughs> so always buy two. I don't understand this. Uh, the guitar nut is cheap. You buy a Tusk nut, I think they're what, five to 10 bucks. Just buy two, have them, why not? Um, and do it again. And then, believe it or not, if you really, if you, let me put it this way, when I really care, because I try to care, <laughs> when I really care about what a customer really wants when they don't want it, um, when I cut a nut, I'm always prepared to cut another one in case of that reason. Somebody, So if you brought that to me and you were saying, hey, Phil, man, it's the G-strings resonating more, I would be ready on the spot to cut another one, drop that in there, and have the two to play with to see if it follows that, right? Because um, the reality is this. You're talking about little, like I said, little movements, little things that can emphasize problems. And that's what sounds like happening. That, you're just letting that, that G-string just go crazy. I would cut a new nut. and But it's, it's super easy, as you saw. Just do it out. And use that first one as a template, as a guideline, just slightly different. Try it again. That's what I would do. However, one of the things you can do which I'll do if to save time. Now that's a little bit more longer time. So let me tell you the, the, the save time thing. I always take a piece of paper and I will sometimes take a piece of paper and tear it or cut it in a little piece and stick it in the nut and then put the string on that and tighten the string up and see if that changes the tone and kind of raise, you know what I mean, things and see if I, you see what I'm saying? You kind of mess with stuff to see if you can change it that way. That's a faster way. A little piece of paper goes a long way when it comes to the nut slots on a guitar, just stick it in there. Um, the other thing I can do, a little trick I'll do is I'll take the, the string out of the nut slot. This is your, your 
slot for your G-string, this your G-string, I'll pull it up and just put it on the actual top of the nut, the shelf part, and then tune it just a little bit and then hit it and to see if the problem changes. And that lets me know how much of the problem is coming from that slot. And that, again, I'm just trying to isolate the problem. Diagnosing is actually the thing you want to master if you want to repair guitars. Building guitars is about finishing a process and getting really good at get, you know, making this guitar work. But repairs are, that's why sometimes I don't like it when builders are repair guys and vice versa, because they're two different passions. And I think you can be fantastic at both, but I think it's hard to keep your passion equalized. I like chasing a problem. You know what I mean? I like that. I, you know, some guys get frustrated. They're like, I can build a guitar better than this. And I'm like, right. I like sometimes trying to figure out exactly what caused this one guitar to act differently than the others. I think that's fun. So in your case, I think that's uh, what you need to do is chase the, the isolate the problem and, cha and, cha and see if you can chase it and find it. Try a piece of paper in there. Try a couple of things. But definitely don't be afraid to put a new nut in there. Uh, even one of the drop-in ones. You said it's a MIM Strat. There's a drop-in ready one. Just throw it in there and see if that's better than what you did. See if that works. Um... Okay, Sean P. Sean P. says, hey, Phil, building a do-it-yourself guitar kit, 72 Tele Deluxe with humbuckers. Change the uh, input jack. I know we all know he means output jack, uh, but, you know, you know. <laughs> and double-checking wiring, getting a lot of hum and buzz through the amp. What is the correct order to troubleshoot? Sure, of course. Um, well, the first thing you want to do is isolate, make sure that there's no grounding issues. That's the biggest thing. Um is the is is the is the thing the other thing you want to do if you have another guitar make sure you plug another guitar into the amp isolate that that's again just troubleshooting right simple solutions make sure that the the other guitar plugs in the amp you don't have the issue you've isolated it's not the guitar cable or the amp i know this is pretty easy stuff but again just walking you through it's like when you lose your keys I'm trying to help you walk through it um then what you want to do is then i want you to isolate it is the guitar we know it's going to be a couple of easy culprits it's most likely if you're getting a lot of hum and buzz besides the fa yeah, fact that you know uh it sounds like the 72 deluxe so you have humbuckers not single coils shouldn't be 60 cycle hum it's definitely going to be a ground issue of some sort so you got to figure out what it is that's not grounded correctly um so it's a let's see i'm just trying to read your question one more time to see if there's anything more specific the other thing i can do sean is the same thing man if you send me a picture to ask know your gear at gmail.com just send me a picture say quick synopsis keep it short what it is let me look inside there I'll send back real quick, like, if I see anything wacky, you know what I mean? That helps. I like to, if I can see something obvious, that's a, what a great way, right? I'll say, hey, do this. If I can't see it, at least I'll send you back saying, I don't see it. You might want to try these ideas next. Um, Michael Back says, hey, Phil, why do you think that the guitar community seems to be shifted towards electrics? <laughs> Just more gear to collect and experiment with? Yeah, of course. Yeah, electrics are... Are, uh, are they got more stuff, man. You can get pedals and, and amps and weird things. Um, I, I find, you know, because as you, you know, a lot of people know what's the channel. I'm a bass player primarily. Um, and everybody's like, you should do more bass videos. And if you look behind me, you see there's one bass behind me. It's uh, because I only have like a couple of basses. <laughs> I don't really collect basses. I don't need a lot of basses. I don't need a lot of guitars. I have a few acoustic, or acoustic guitars. I have a few acoustic guitars. Same thing. I have my Arts and Luthier behind me. I have a Taylor. Um, I have a couple acoustics. I probably have like four acoustics, five acoustics. I love them. I play them probably as much, if not more, than my electrics. But yeah, it's just harder to, to do that as a whole. We're electrics look different there's a lot of things going on um but that's why it seems to be towards it but so you know not all communities are the same there are communities out there that are heavy into acoustics so grumpy mike says hey phil do you have a favorite brand or type of strap lock yeah i generally use the dimarzio strap locks although i switched to the Dodario lock strap system i like that um that's really cool but as strap locks when i'm using strap locks um, you know, there's Schaller makes good ones and Dunlop makes good ones. Some people have issues with both. Um, the only thing I tell everybody is this, it's, I think you're fine. No matter what happens wrong rumor wise with the Schallers or the Dunlops, keep in mind what we're learning now is there's so many fake Schallers and Dunlops out there that a lot of times when people go, I bought one and it was crappy. Now we're realizing like strings and other stuff that they might've bought a fake because there's so many fakes out there. But, uh, the... The point of the story is whatever you pick, you got to be aware that you want to stick with that from now on. So uh, be aware of that. The only thing I will tell you is this. I like Dunlop, but if you get Dunlop, get the dual design one, which means you can actually put a regular strap on it. Don't get the solid uh, uh, solid ones that, that, that don't have the, 
the mushroom at the at the end. Um, so there you go, Grumpy Mike. I hope that works out. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of other, so you know everybody will probably suggest in the comments all these other ones out there. I've tried so many of them out there, but there's a reason why I recommend Schaller and Dunlop. It's because they've been around forever. They're easy, relatively inexpensive, comparatively speaking. Although the knockoffs are cheaper, don't be you know just keep in mind the knockoffs are cheaper. If you want to save some money, you can get strap locks for like a nickel now out there. Um, and then Seb37 says, Solar or Ibanez? Ibanez, but I love my Solar. But I mean, I you know, you're asking me a question, Solar or Ibanez. If I would pick one, uh, the problem is, is that if I, the problem is, is that Ibanez is I have like my AZs and stuff. There's something that's more in line with what I do than the Solar. The Solar is fun for me. It's a great guitar. It sounds great. It plays great. It looks cool. It's nice to have because it's different than everything else I have. And when I plug it in, I play it. I get to shred and do some cool stuff. But the Ibanez is more in my in my wheelhouse, but I like them both, but I'm an Ibanez guy for sure. Uh, uh, Rick USA, I was just on the... <laughs> All right, man. This, Rick USA, you get it, man. I'm going to give you the, the comment. Here it is. He says, uh, I just was on the Evangelical channel and asked them Strat or Les Paul. They definitely, uh, they said, definitely Strat. I knew Jesus rocks. Okay, that's funny. <laughs> that was funny. Uh, okay. Uh, and lighthearted funny. Hopefully nobody got offense for that. I don't think that took it too far out of the out of the wheelhouse of us. Uh, YT1, wait, YT 1344 or 1344 or 1344. Uh, it says three bolt neck strat 70s, any different sustained tone. Yeah, they wiggle and they suck. Uh, it was a bad idea. <laughs> it was. Um, but we, we love those strats because we, you know, it's funny. It's funny to me. It doesn't take much in the comments. You'll see that they're going to be people who are like 70 strats suck. And then some people are like, I collect them. And the reality was there was a time where we made fun of 70 strats. The next kind of wiggled because of that thing. The funny thing about that is, is that, is that they, they did the three, this is not a joke. They did the three bolt system. CBS did that. Um, to save money on a, a screw. Isn't that funny? They wanted to cut one screw out of the equation, and save some money. Um, the, uh, <laughs> but, but what's funny about that is, uh, you know, there's no advantages to it. Let me put it that way. Uh, th so by that s tone, I don't think there's any disadvantages. Like I wouldn't say anything bad, but they were known for wiggling a little bit more and doing stuff. So, so there you go. <laughs> There, there you go. All right, let's, uh, since we went bonus time, let me make sure. Hold on, let me redo this. Uh, Mike Martinez just said, good work. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Let's do a, um, okay, let's see. Let's do two things. Since there's 763 of us, let's do two things. Let me find a question and then maybe make an announcement. Um, the question I'm going to find is, Oh, okay. Wayne, on a side note, Wayne Y says Ernie Ball has some nice stra uh, strap locks. Yeah, like I said, I I've seen a ton of strap lock companies. I just refer to those two, Dunlop and Schaller. But like I said, I think you guys would, you know, have great recommendations. I I don't even necessarily know if all the knockoff ones are bad. I, I, I don't have enough experience. I try not to kind of like, you know, give guesses. I try to like follow on the experience. So um, let's see. And there is, what else? Hold on. There's got to be another one before we do the announcement. Oh, here's one. It's not an easy question. It uh, says, have you tried Daddario tape wound bass strings? Yep. I have a video about them. I will link it in the index. I love them. Uh, absolutely. There are, uh, I use them all the time, been using them for years. Fantastic. Uh, by any means. So there you go. Um, on that note, uh, let's see, are we doing scar? My guitar was talking about doing a giveaway guitar today. And let's see if I have, what do I have? There's a couple things. So let's start with this. Um, this. Let me show it to you real quick. I'm gonna show it to you and then I'll go away for a second. 
So they're building a guitar and they want to do a giveaway. We were talking about doing the giveaway today, but I don't think the guitar got done. Is that, let me see if I can look. And let's see. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so they basically what they were talking about was, hold on a second, is uh, doing a giveaway. Scar My Guitar reached out to me and they want to do some giveaways. We basically want to do that, but I want to make sure we want to make sure that we're all set up. So maybe we'll set it for next week. We talked about this week, but they were saying that basically you want to go to their channel and subscribe, but I don't know if the guitar is done. So I didn't, I saw he was, Sean's been great at messaging me all week, but I've literally been swamped as always, unfortunately. You know, when you're a one man shop, you kind of get a lot of stuff done. I got a lot of hats to wear each day. Um, so what happens is we will, uh, I'll put a link in the description and what we'll do is we'll, hold on, let, let me make sure I'm not reading anything. I'm not missing anything. Let's see. He, okay, so Sean's saying it's still drying and it'll be ready to ship on Monday. Okay, so do we want to do the giveaway? Do you want to do the giveaway for the Scarmo guitar? See, you guys are all hanging out. Let's see. Yeah, let's, he's going to say something in a second. I'll go off whatever he says. <laughs> Lawrence says he can relate. Yeah, I, it's nuts. I'm, uh, I don't even want to talk about it. So much stuff. Okay, it's ready. Okay. So is Bam Mozzie going to do the giveaway? Is that what we decided? Bam Mozzie was going to pick the winner of someone who is live here today. Now, so you know, to win this guitar, there's a couple things. First, you want to make sure you go to Scarmo Guitar and subscribe to the channel. They're a new channel. They're they're trying to get some subscriptions. They're trying to do some fun stuff. They do great stuff. We're going to do a collab with them uh, where we're going to do a Sharpa Max guitar crossover kind of thing. And uh, that's going to be really cool. He might be messaging me right now. The other thing is also is, hold on a second. Is, yep, he says we're ready. Good. Okay, so uh, you want to make sure you subscribe. The other thing you have to remember is that they can't ship the guitar outside the U.S. I'm sorry, Canada and Europe and everyone else. I'm sorry. I didn't make sign. Uh, rules, but it's just too hard for a small thing. The other thing is, if you win the guitar, you have to pay the shipping. So I know that stinks too, but don't keep in mind, man. Shipping shouldn't cost more than 60, 70 bucks to ship it anywhere in the US and you're going to get a, uh, a guitar made by Skarma Guitar. That's pretty cool. So um, my understanding is Bam Mozzie is picking the winner. Is that correct? And then, then everybody says... Pay. So, on that note, I'll let Bam Mozzie do his thing. He's been a long-time watcher, too, by the way. And I'm getting messages about all kinds of stuff. Okay, cool. And uh, let's do it. Let's give away a guitar. All right. Uh, and... It, Is ba <laughs> this is going to be fun. Is Bam Mozzie here? <laughs> or I'll pick the winner. Maybe I'll just do it. Let's see. Skarmagar says not in USA, Phil. You mean we don't... Okay. All right. Uh... Yeah, so somebody says Bam Ozzy just woke up. All right, you know what? Maybe I'll pick the winner. Okay, and while we're doing that, I got a super chat. And it says, Tim Rod, 1984, says, I've seen people and guitar techs use lighter fluid to clean guitars. Can this be done on any finish? What are your thoughts? No, you know what? I've never seen... I mean, you can use lighter fluid to take... Uh, 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 what do you call it? To take... Um, uh, you know, like the glue off of stickers off guitars and stuff. I don't use it for that. What usually you use somebody using lighter fluid to clean is the fretboard. Um, so you can use it for that. Absolutely. Uh, it, it's, you know, I mean, I've had to use lighter fluid to clean fretboards and a razor blade to scrape all the tar off the fretboard from someone who chain smokes and was playing the guitar from years. So yeah, but I don't use it on the finish. I don't know if necessarily there's anything wrong with using it on the finish. I just don't. I use it for cleaning only the fretboard and only rosewood fretboards. So 
because uh, it, it basically it dries off. So um, on that note, hold on a second. And hold on. And in Scarma Guitar, I'm just going to confirm with them since I don't see Bam Ozzy. Oh, Bam Ozzy, there you are. Let Phil do it. It's his channel. All right. So I'm going to pick a winner just randomly. All right. I'll do a trivia then. Let's see. What's the trivia? I should have been prepared for this. <laughs> you guys are funny. I'm enjoying this so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Lawrence Petros says uh, Hendrix used lighter fluid. So. All right. So if you want to win the guitar, let's just randomly, like I said, I, we're not going to be, this is more fun. We're all small channels doing stuff. We're trying to interact with the community. So we're not going to make this too crazy and too hard. Okay. Um, you guys know if you win it, you have to be in the U S and you have to pay shipping. And, and then what you do is you'll reach, you'll email me at ask, know your gear, and I'll forward it over to Skarma guitar, Sean and the, and those guys will take care of you. Um, okay. On that note, hold on a second. And the answer is for no, I'm just scrolling right now. I'm not even looking at names. I'm looking at comments to see if there's anything that pops as a random thing. And it looks like Reza Khan is the winner. Uh, R-E-Z-A-K-H-A-N for no reason whatsoever. I just scrolled and just stopped. Like <laughs> I can scroll from my, my mouse and stopped. That's where it stopped. So uh, as soon as they confirm that they're good to win it, we know they'll win it. They'll, they're the winner, and if they win, they get the guitar, and uh, or if they say hi, so I know that they saw this. Rezicon, you have to email me at askknowyourgear at gmail.com. Just put that you're the winner and you're Rezicon, and, and uh, I will forward you over to Skarma Guitar. Like I said, make sure you guys subscribe to Skarma Guitar because this isn't the only thing that they're going to be doing with us. We want They want to do the giveaway. They thought that would be fun to talk about this, uh, this Friday. I want to thank uh, those guys because, like I said, this is something that they did. I didn't have to do anything, just hang out <laughs> and say something. So, But uh, what we're talking about doing... And if you go to their channel, you'll see that they're actually been posting some videos. You'll see that there's a guitar neck with the Know Your Gear logo in it. I'm sure that's going to give away a lot going on right now. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Bam Mosley said no shipping costs in the U.S. Oh, cool. Outside the U.S. I have to pay shipping. Good to know. Um, but anyways, the, the point is, is that uh, we're going to be doing a Sharpen My Axe slash guitar thing, and there'll be something fun coming up. We'll announce that. On that note, I think I'm going to wait a few minutes just to make sure everybody got taken care of, and then we're going to call it. This has been one of the longest live hangs I've done in a while. So, And I have editing to do. I'm going to go back to work as soon as I'm done with this, and then index. So... Like I said, make sure, you know, Adam, oh, sorry, Aaron Cram says, make sure you subscribe anyway. What I was basically saying is, yeah, same thing. Subscribe anyway, because we're going to be doing something else. And, uh, you know, you're going to probably want to see it because it's cool. We're going to do something. They they really want to do something with the Sharp Max stuff. And I'm doing, I have like six Sharp Max videos in production right now, plus another big announcement uh, to, to, to talk about that. So I'm very excited about all that stuff. So a lot of stuff. That's why I've been, like I said, busy. I was trying to knock out all the traveling. Now that I'm back, this is where my brain and mind is at. On that note, I want to do a quick shout out for, of course, the crew that makes this happen every week. This is my patrons. Uh, literally, uh, uh, you know, it's funny. It was, this is the fourth quarter of the year, and I was looking at this, and, and it was funny. I had no idea how much patron support really supports the channel. Um, so I just thought I'd do this shout-out. Actually, to be honest with you, I'm doing this shout-out not only to say thank you to them, but just to remind uh, you guys how important this is. Um, this channel, only 5% of the total income that I get from this channel comes from any interactions with companies in any way, and that includes products sent to me. So that should give you a, a really interesting thing, and I mean in since the channel's inception. That's the number. So 95% of everything that I make, you see from the super chats, the patrons, the t-shirt sales, the, uh, the, uh, the, there's links, you know, when a link and I get a, a, you know, some, some change or whatever to send somebody in a direction, which I don't really talk about that, but they're down there. If you see them, sometimes they're there. Um, and then of course, you know, the YouTube dollars and, and I'm very happy and very excited that I have this. And, and I, so I just want to say this, but I really want to thank these guys specifically because like I said, um, 
I don't have any really strong financial relationships with any companies, and I don't really intend to, uh, especially since it hasn't been growing. It seems like it's been decreasing over the last year or two, uh, my interactions that way, uh, because of this, because of the fact that you guys help support this channel and help me do the stuff I want to do. Like I said, we would never do these uh, tech tip videos and, and Sharp Max videos and stuff if uh, if I had to rely on the companies. Um, James Biles, Lawrence Petros, Rob Martha, Dave David Foy, uh, Blake Bean, Derek Miller, uh, Gene Graham, Michael Mooney, Alasdair McLeod, Bruce Collins, Andy Dennis, Gary Phillips, Sam Oram, Chief Squatch, Muse Guitarist, Bob Crosley, Todd Flowers, Tim Farnsworth, Zesty Basil Pizza, Greg Peterson, Dennis Prescott, Craig Parker, Lonnie Hoke, Just, uh, Joseph McCarthy, Anthony Desposito, Brian Stewart, Kermit Jackson, Tim Camacho, Paul Ostrich, Michael Lindner, Jonathan Pickering, Bob Peckwode. Sorry, Pickwode. I don't know why I'm saying Peckwode, Bob. Sorry. <laughs> You know what it is? Because Bob came up to me once in the store and said, you know, you've been saying my name wrong forever. It's Bob Pickwode, not not Wood, but Bob Pickwode. Louis and Alvaro, Chris from the Guitar Pit. Check out his channel uh, and his Instagram. Uh, Jeff Howes, BV Ninja, Zachary Rowe, Justin Mabe, and Jeff Thompson literally make this stuff happen. Plus all the super chats, plus you guys watching and commenting and subscribing. Uh, literally, like I said, it's it's almost the entire value of the channel as, as comes from all that stuff. So I want to thank you guys because... Uh, you're the guys I need to thank. So on that note, thanks Skarma Guitar for doing a giveaway. That was really cool. Th uh, check out uh, uh, Micah and his dad's uh, uh, auction because like I said, if you want to do something like that and uh, I'll let you guys have a great weekend and I'll talk to you guys next week and uh, look forward to some cool videos because it's a, uh, uh, <laughs> Cirrus Lee says, can you see my tax returns? Oh, you would be, you would laugh. <laughs> <laughs> you you would laugh. Uh, uh, like I said, I've been in business for myself for 15 years. Trust me, it's like uh, there's no Lamborghinis here. Um, let's see. Uh, but um, hold on. There is. Okay, cool. I just want to say RNA Music was here. I'll do a quick shout out since the show went so long. Uh, Del Palmer, of course, a longtime viewer, th supporter. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Guitars, thank you. I'm going to say goodbye to a few. Phil Mosley Music, thank you so much. Uh, David Munez, like I said, you guys make this happen every week. I appreciate it. Um, I will make sure I index this for you guys watching this on the replay. And as always, uh, thank you so much for your time. And until next week, uh, know your gear. And then we'll let you go.